Key. Part 4. Middle. Kate studied her reflection intently, planning the big day's makeup with a practiced eye. Carefully placed over a nearby chair was a white wedding dress. That would go on last. Leaning closer and holding up one eyelid with an index finger, she brought a small brush near her eyelash and froze, startled as behind her an abrupt crackle of electricity sounded and cut off. In the mirror was a man standing behind her, mid-forties, lean and wrapped in a long winter coat, with a lined, serious face and graying hair under an old trilby. There was a long beat before he spoke. Miss Griffin? Another before she responded. How far have you come back? Just five years. I see. And what do the Tomor want with me? Nothing. But my client did pay them. And is your client me? Yes. She turned around. I once knew a man who paid someone to go back and kill him as a baby. I'm not a killer. He didn't just want to die. He hated his life so much he wanted to erase it. He still wanted his friends to remember him, though. So he paid for everything. The aliens arranged it. And that's why I can remember knowing someone who never existed. But I have to wonder, what kind of a person could do that to a baby boy? Do you know? I'm just a messenger. And my company doesn't do that kind of job. Interesting that I didn't come back myself. I'm getting married today. Does the marriage turn out so badly? Is that what you're here to tell me? That I shouldn't go through with it? Miss Griffin, in five years' time, you're serving a prison sentence. You were driving while drunk, and you crashed the car. The passengers were your husband and your young son. She spun back around and stared intensely into the mirror, but avoided the man's reflected gaze. Were they badly injured? Did I kill them? No, don't tell me. When did it happen? No, don't tell me that either. Is the message that I can avoid it or I can't? You are able to avoid it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Redstone. Well, Mr. Redstone, it seems I do know what kind of a person could kill a baby boy. I suppose my future self is trying to erase herself, too. I prefer to think of it as giving oneself a second chance. Kate didn't say anything, and after a few seconds, Redstone touched a device on his wrist, before blinking out of existence with another burst of static. Kate raised the brush to her eye. A technician looked up as Redstone zipped back into existence. The hum of electronics and the chatter of white-coated engineers surrounded the transport pad in the middle of the lab. That was quick, remarked the tech, screwdriver in hand. Successful? I think so, said Redstone, stepping off the dais. Smart lady, no hysterics. We'll know in a few minutes whether the warning was enough. I'll check, Mr. Redstone. Oh, and there's someone waiting for you in your office. Client or management? I don't think it's either, but he says it's urgent. Okay, okay. I'll see what he wants. The man in the office was pale, pudgy, thirty-something, and dressed in cream slacks, a pink shirt, and sports jacket. The feet, in argyle socks and golfing shoes, were on the desk. And, in the late afternoon dimness, he was wearing... Wrap around sunglasses. Ah, Mr. Rosenstein. Do sit down. Redstone flicked on the coffee machine before answering. It's been Redstone for three generations, and that's my chair you're sitting in. What did you want to see me about? My name is Johnson. Well, actually it isn't, but that's not important. I work for the Central Intelligence Agency. And you want to go back in time and arrest Al Capone. Or is it Lee Harvey Oswald this time? Have you any idea how many cranks we get in here, claiming to be big-shot secret agents out to save the world? Show me your ID. Grinning, Johnson reached into his jacket pocket, 
revealing an empty shoulder holster, and took out a folding black plastic ID wallet. Redstone glanced at it before tossing it back and sitting down. It doesn't look fake, so what do you want? Have you ever thought, I mean really thought, Mr. Redstone, about our friends, the Tomor? I mean, you do work for them? I work for Temporal Interlocutors, PLC. The clients approach us, we negotiate with the Tomor, and, if the client wishes, we handle the assignment, too. Everyone gets their cut, and everything gets done professionally. My employer is a man named Hamza. Heh. Do you remember that day, when the aliens landed? They crashed. In the Indian Ocean. Fifteen years ago. We thought we were being invaded. Green, bug-eyed monsters from Mars, with heat rays and tripods. Except they're not from Mars, or they might be. They won't tell us. And they might be green and bug-eyed. But we don't know, because they won't let us see them. To this day, no human has ever seen what they look like. Don't you find that suspicious, Mr. Redstone? Redstone shrugged. Johnson took his feet off the table, steepled his fingers under his chin, and, resting his elbows on the blotter, leaned earnestly forward to continue. So they come crashing down, but apparently it's not an invasion. They don't want our women, and they don't want to anally probe us. They say they can't fix their ship and go home. They say it's against their customs to show themselves. We're not ready or suitable or something. If there's a point, Mr. Johnson, please feel free to come to it. Okay. Here's a race with the technology to destroy us, enslave us, anything they want. And what do they do? They go into business. One day, they're the first extraterrestrial life mankind has ever encountered. The next, they're another minority ethnicity with their own chain of shops. Why, Mr. Redstone? Why? I thought business was the American way. Maybe they prefer to adapt themselves to their hosts, to us. Johnson waved it away. Have you ever stopped to think about their business model? For a one-hour trip to the past, one-fifth of everything you've got, even if that's nothing. Crazy. You want to go somewhere permanently? Everything you could have had if you hadn't gone away. Even if you've only got a week to live, how can they even take stuff that doesn't exist? Crazy squared. As Johnson had been speaking, the coffee had boiled, and Redstone got up to pour himself a cup. Would you like some coffee, Mr. Johnson? Behind his sunglasses, Johnson looked annoyed that his flow had been interrupted. Black. No sugar. Redstone carried the two cups back to the table, sat and sipped. I'm not an economist, and I'm thinking you're not either. They operate on the same principles on every continent, and it seems to work for them and us. Besides which, I wasn't aware the CIA was now investigating tax returns. You want to know what I think, Mr. Redstone? I've a feeling you want to tell me, Mr. Johnson. I don't think it's about the money at all. I think it's about making us dependent on them. It's about subtle, slow, insidious control. Then I suggest you put your theory on a website. There's plenty of them saying the same thing. They're buying their way in with counterfeit currency. Think about it. Multiple timelines all neatly tied up. They won't tell us how. People who've never lived, but the children they had still alive. How? They won't say. Paradoxes everywhere, and somehow it's not a problem. Unless, unless, none of it's real. You go back, have a chat with yourself. You come back, and a few minutes later, you remember meeting your younger self, and an older self coming back to meet you years ago, and what would have happened if you hadn't gone back. It doesn't make sense, unless it's all some kind of virtual reality hoax, or they're messing with your mind to make you think you've hopped back in time. But it's all a fake. Mr. Johnson, 
You dress like an idiot. You talk like a maniac. But you're not either. If you truly are from the CIA, you didn't come here to discuss your paranoid theories. Okay, here's what I think. We don't have time travel. They do, and they let us use it. Sometimes, and on their terms. And what do they let us do? An old man wants to visit his childhood sweetheart. A mother begs her young self to stop smoking before it kills her baby. Someone wants to do a fancy suicide. They won't even let someone send back last week's lottery numbers. They're sitting on the greatest force for good this country has ever seen, and they're using it for Samaritan projects. We could use it to go back and arrest a serial killer before they've even started killing, give them the psychiatric treatment they need. Stop a suicide bomber before they even buy the explosive. Or assassinate a rebel leader. Win a battle after it's been lost. Change the inconvenient result of an election. And what would be wrong with that if democracies served? We've offered them billions, billions, in exchange for making the world a better place, and they just say no. We've given them blank checks and the most favorable contracts imaginable for just the blueprints of their machines. They just refuse to play ball. Sanctimonious hypocrites. I thought you said none of it was real. That's what I think. But if it is real, then they don't deserve to be operating on American soil. They're working against the interests of the free world, and we shouldn't stand for it. So kick them out. And let Europe and Asia and Africa have them all to themselves. Or else point a tank at the embassy and see if they're more communicative. God damn it, man. We have... Silence. You have? Johnson's face twisted in annoyance, as though he'd let slip a guilty secret. He took off his sunglasses and leaned forward. We sent in a SWAT team, the New York Embassy. The next day, all the soldiers wake up in their own beds, and none of them remember anything after they got through the front doors. All the video feeds recorded only static. All the broken glass and bullet holes, undone. A few civilians saw it, but their memories got wiped too. Only the brass who gave the orders had any recall. The aliens are untouchable. Redstone sat back and swigged his coffee. And you're telling me about this highly classified military cock-up because... Because you work with the aliens. They trust you. You've got access to the embassy. The staff all know you, and... They let you use their toys. You could go back in time and... Well, sniff them out. Find out what really happened when they crashed. You want me to spy for you. We can make it worth your while. And you can make me homeless if I refuse. So what's to stop me walking through the reconstituted doors of the embassy and telling them all about you? Maybe you'll wake up with your life rewritten. You're a patriot. Not your kind of patriot. And I think you want to know what's really happening as much as we do. All you have to do is keep your eyes open and listen out for anyone letting anything slip. And if you should accidentally turn down any wrong corridors and find doors marked no admittance, no one could blame you for peeking. Redstone took his time downing the last of his coffee, then stared into the empty cup for a while, pondering. Then, how do I contact you? Johnson beamed. We'll arrange everything. You've made the right decision for everyone. Back in the lab, the technician was still working on the same piece of equipment. Mrs. Griffin says thank you, and so do her family. That's good to know. Your visitor, another one? Yep, another one. Genuine? Don't know yet, but not very bright. Are we set up for the next trip? Ready now. Redstone stepped up onto the pad. Invisible energy crackled, and he disappeared. <laughs>